standing outside the Dorchester Hotel in London, uh, about to go into the global press conference for 4 2 The Dark World. Um, question for Chris and Tom, if I may. Um, you know, the subject to trust is prevalent within the film, and I wondered, having worked together now on a number of films, whether you're free to experiment because there is a trust between you as actors. Sure, I mean, it's certainly a, a shorthand we have from, uh, you know, having this being the third film we've shot together now, and you go and spend uh, a chunk of your shooting time getting to know one another, you know, we were able to pick up where we left off and have developed a, a great friendship along the way, and um, I don't know, from the beginning we, we were lucky, we just had a, a chemistry in the same kind of enthusiasm, and, um, you know, that's the relationship I look forward to, you know, really delving into um, every time is, being able to ask the questions that Thor and Loki haven't really had the acute focus to do so yet, and uh, this instance was uh, that you know that was a, the great opportunity we had. I love you, man. I love you. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's absolutely true. Right? Um, it's um, you know from from the beginning of, of Kenneth Branagh's Thor all the way through Joss Whedon's Avengers and into into Alan's Dark World. Um, it's it has been an amazing adventure for both of us and um, and the two characters define each other and need each other and, and um, <clears throat> all acting is, is, is about um, what happens in the space between people and, um, and and the more you trust each other the deeper you can go and, and uh, when I'm on set with Chris whatever he serves I'll return and he'll return back and, and, um, and that is the joy of it for me. Another thing, this is uh, that sibling rivalry, now, because you've got uh, two brothers, and I just wondered whether you uh, drew on your relationship with them for your in to inform your interactions with Loki, mm -hmm. and also as they're both actors, do you uh, find that there's a lot of competition between the Hemsworth brothers? Uh, Nick Robin have attempted to take over the universe just yet, um, <laughs> but I think I'd have the same reaction if I did. Um, <laughs> it, well, we're competitive as siblings are, and kind of everything from sport and backyard cricket, football, surfing, to who's controlling the remote control, watching TV. Uh, this industry, not so much. You know, I think we, uh, or certainly all three of us understand the sort of frailty and inconsistency of you know, the work and, and uh, you know, we help each other with auditions and always have and, and whatever scripts we're working on. And, um, you know, you're not in direct competition anyway. And, and, and uh, it's more of a kind of team effort with this, this than, than anything else. What about your uh, using the relationship uh, as part of your work? With so, sorry. Yeah, sure. Well, look, the, I mean, one of the scenes uh, where they're, you know, um, in, in the spaceship sort of uh, exiting Asgard, that Tom and I were pretty insistent on saying, no, this has got to feel like, you know, when you're in the back seat with your siblings and, you know, we couldn't get 100 metres down the road before, you know, the three of us would be like, don't touch me, you know, God, this is this. <laughs> and, uh, and that kind of, uh, you know, certainly played into that scene and a lot of the stuff. You understand what it's like to have that kind of love-hate sort of thing and, and you do anything for them, but at the same time, the simplest things going to annoy you. And, um, and uh, yeah, I did certainly, you know, try and draw from whatever experiences I've been through or can empathise with frustration towards one's sibling. Fantastic. Was that question answer for Tom, by the way? It was. It, it was. Okay. Um, uh, well, I, I had two sisters, and um, so it's, a, it's slightly different, I suppose. It's different, but I have long hair, but like what they do. <laughs> long blonde hair, both long hair. Um, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose the thing about the siblings is, is they, they know you. They know you. They know you better than anyone, and there's that that thing of always being bound together um, by your history is 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 um, something. There's something very honest about the interaction that, that you can't lie in front of your 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 siblings. And I love in in this film. I love that um, Thor is able to 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 um, demand from Loki that he play his hand. You know, Loki's someone who's constantly in control. He'll never show you how he really feels, and the only person who gets close to it is Thor, and that seems very true of sibling relationships. Um, and uh, I absolutely second the spaceship scene. Uh, <laughs> I've actually been on a road trip with Chris and Liam, and uh, 
You're the worst, Charlie. What do you think? It's very funny. Yeah, it's quicker. No, it's not. And then if you spend time with Luke, he just is like, he just, you know, knocks both their heads together and says, shut up, boys. <laughs> yeah, he's the older brother, right? Four, are you actually brothers with Loki? <laughs> No, uh, well, um, I wish Tough we question. <laughs> we, in the film, we do actually have different, uh, different parents. And uh, Loki was adopted into the Asgardian family. But uh, we love, we love one another like brothers, yeah. First of all, to Natalie, obviously in the first film, um, Jane was very much a spectator, whereas this time she's right in the middle of Thor's world. I wonder if that was part of what excited you about the prospect of coming back. I guess for Chris and Tom, how nice was it for you to this time have a very beautiful third wheel to your dynamic? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's very nice, thank you. Um, yeah, it was it was exciting to get to come back and, and work with everyone and, and meet people who, who were joining this time. And, and also, because Jane gets to go to Asgard this time, I was lucky enough to get to work more with Tom. And, Tessies with Renee and Anthony too were amazing and I just got to admire from afar. And then also just continue the, the fun rapport with, with Kat and Stella and Chris and it was definitely a lot of laughing, maybe too much laughing <laughs> <laughs> on set. Interesting DVD extras on this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, it was brilliant to have uh, and Natalie there and, and to break up some of the the, the godly testosterone of Thor and Loki <laughs> kind of doing their thing with the beautiful Jane. So, yeah. yeah. I, I loved working um, with Natalie. In, in the first film, uh, Loki's aware of Jane Foster's um, presence and refers to her. But uh, it was so fun to see what happens when the two share the same space. <laughs> Violence, as you see. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, that's the first move. What's it like compared to filming in Hollywood? How different is it filming in the UK? Uh, the interesting thing about Hollywood is, uh, it, I mean, I don't know that a lot of stuff gets shot there anymore. Obviously, once upon a time it did. Um, but it's predominantly kind of sets and studios. The nice thing about here is there's incredible studios, but there's brilliant locations to take advantage of. And, and I love the aesthetic this film has because, uh, you know, not only Asgard, but we get to see London. And, uh, and you know, most of these films are set with sort of New York or an American city as the backdrop. And I, I love that difference. And yeah, I do love shooting here. Yeah, I would echo Chris in that it's, it's hard to compare because we don't really shoot in Hollywood at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I love working here though, and I'm envious of, of British actors and British crews because American and uh, Australian actors too, we end up like gypsies, you know, yeah. from movie to movie, you're moving um, cities all the time, and you can really have such a fulfilling, wonderful, rich career doing between the theater, the TV here, and the, and the film all in London. It's pretty, pretty cool to get to live and work in the same place. Yeah. I just want to bring Kevin on that actually because uh, Marvel have uh, used London a lot, are going to use London a lot in the future. Uh, what's it about London that's, that, that's so great for, for uh, your, your studio? Well, I, it's no secret that there's, a, that there's a, a very good tax incentive which lures the studios here. <laughs> uh, I don't want to pretend that's not the case, but, but what keeps us here, what keeps us coming back are the amazing crews, which is unbelievable. We're starting our fourth film uh, next year at Shepparton, um, and it's been an amazing experience, uh, all four of them. If Comic Con's anything to go by, people really love Loki. What do you think it is about Loki that people seem to really love, kind of more over Thor? Seven more years of friendly therapy to follow. Can I tell you what I love about Loki? <laughs> We've been talking about this all morning, it's very hard to, uh, you have a go as well, but I, I, I don't know that it was ever the plan to have Loki in this many films, but purely to do with everything that Tom brought to the table in the first one and how incredible he was and the, the mixture of, uh, of strength and villainous and, and mischief and, and, and vulnerability. Uh, it, which is such an access point, you, you can immediately kind of empathise with this misunderstood guy. Is why he was we kept you know if I'm um, like right, Kevin why he kept bringing him back into every film like I don't know if that was ever the plan but I mean my hat goes off to 
Tom, and, and I think he's done such an incredible job in every film, and hopefully we can keep sneaking him in more somewhere. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I wanted to say in response to the second part, I, I think Loki is defined by Thor. He's defined in opposition to him. That they are yin and yang. They are the sort of the sun and the moon. That the, the, the whole point of them is that they are um, in opposition. And uh, the whole sort of, um, I don't know, the, the popularity of the character has been such an amazing surprise. I'd never expected it in my wildest dreams. Um, and um, I don't know, I, I found him a fascinating prospect because he's a mixture of, of, um, of playfulness and charm and mischief. Um, that's his moniker, he's the god of mischief. So there's a, a playfulness to him, but he's such a broken, a broken character. He's grief-stricken and bitter and jealous and angry and lonely and proud. And so the cocktail of all of his kind of psychological damage and and his uh, playfulness it, as an actor is just a, a, a really interesting thing to inhabit. And by the way, you are the only thought. <laughs> <laughs> I also feel this movie has much more humor than any other Marvel film I've ever seen. So. Uh, can you comment on that, maybe, Alan and Kevin? Um, yeah, I'm so grateful to hear that that's what's coming back from the audience as they start to see the film for the first time. I, I think I went into it and I thought my first task was to darken the world and deepen it and dirty it up a little bit. Um, I sort of felt like that was my mandate going in. And then as we started the process, I realized, whoops, um, if we're going to darken it, if we're going to deepen it, if we're going to possibly kill off some characters that we love, we better make darn sure that it's balanced on the other side because the, you know, the key to the Marvel universe and the Marvel language that I was being assaulted by while I was making this movie because Avengers came out while we were starting it and Iron Man 3 came out while you were finishing it was you are screwed if you don't also um, <laughs> keep it funny and light on its feet at the same time. So it's it's called The Dark World and there's certainly dark currents in it, um, but yeah, the, the humor was critical and I can't say enough great things about Stalin. He's, uh, he was the first thing we shot. I think we started with him in um, Stonehenge running around with a fawn on. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he's probably one of the few men I know who walks into it with a new bat and eye and just uh, didn't hesitate for a second. He's hilarious and, and always truthful in his performance. It's just great. And uh, a second comedy, I'm going to bring a cat in on this one. I'm delighted to see that the Darcy still can't pronounce me all new, which is, which is great. Uh, is there a lot of improvisation, though, on the set of a uh, movie like this? Me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, there was a little bit of improv uh, in my first day back, and I'm, I'm on the show in the States, which allows no improv whatsoever, and so when you guys told me I could do that, I, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I was very jet-lagged, so I think banana balls came out of my exhaustion. <laughs> but yeah, I was very happy to be back. You guys gave Darcy some awesome things to say and do. Yes. How do you feel you developed as an actor from the first film to now this? And also for Alan, um, I was surprised to find that this is actually one of the more shorter films, shorter Marvel films, um, of Marvel films. So what was the other two process like? And how much closer can we expect to see uh, the lead to scene points? Uh, who goes first? Chris goes first. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, yeah um, I mean, every film I look back and go, oh, okay, now, now, now I get it. And then I start the next one and go, oh, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's nice to be able to approach your character again and for the third time attack it in a different way with a different director and have a whole new, um, you know, bag of ideas and, and, and influences and, and ways to approach it. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I think I grew up as a person as well as you do through time, uh, strangely enough. And, um, <laughs> As did, you know, so cool. that echoes into whatever you're doing, your work, and, um, uh, you know, it was nice to have a more mature Thor who was sort of um, less petulant and arrogant and teenager, you know, as the first one it was at times, but uh, that transition into him understanding the, uh, the darker side of, of uh, the throne and that responsibility and the sacrifices, and it was fun to play with. Um, so, editing process. Um, yeah, it was, there's a, there's a, there's so many obligations to a movie like this. As I said before, you know, it has to be dark and, and emotionally engaging. It also has to be funny and constantly earn its its sort of entertainment uh, value. And part of that process is condensing and tightening and making it you know roll along as quickly as it can so that it is as 
fun machine, you know, grinds can be. So naturally, some things fall out that uh, you wish didn't fall out. Some things dear to my heart that I love. Um, and Chris Eccleston and I were talking about some things that we really savored that uh, that had to fall away. Uh, I'd be really grateful if some of those appear on a DVD or a Blu-ray at some point. I think they will. I think there's about maybe. 10, 12 minutes of footage on the yeah, I mean, Blu-ray? Oh, that's great. That's yeah. fantastic. There was, there was some rumor going around. Um, this is my first encounter with doing work while the internet watches. <laughs> um, I had a little bit of that in Game of Thrones, but uh, nothing prepared me for this. And uh, there was a rumor about a running time argument at one point. And it was funny because I don't think anybody that I knew, my editors, you, me, we, I don't even know how long the movie was. There was never a running time issue. It was always, you know, how can we make it better, funnier, um, more effective, having to land harder. So in that process, some of my children had to get murdered and put on the floor. But uh, uh, um, I'm sure they'll have an afterlife. Met metaphor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's okay. so Kevin let them go home with a picture of my, my real children. Question is, in terms of the tone, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has kind of matching the comics again, more fantastic more out there. I wonder if the humor was a part, a way of trying to ground some of that to make it palatable. And in the other sense, as the actors, the cast, as the world is getting more fantastical and things are getting more strange, how, what did you find to hook yourself as actors into grounding your performances and trying to stay true to your characters? Uh, humor is definitely the key. Uh, yeah, we've got spaceships in this movie and other planets in this movie. And we have found that humor is an amazing way to get the audience to sort of just embrace and accept uh, uh, all those worlds and all that craziness and all these costumes. Um, it's worked well for us going back to the first uh, Iron Man film. And uh, in terms of grounding your performances, let's start with that, Christopher, and work our way down. Grounded, now I ground, 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 well, I, it's interesting talking about the humour of the film. I saw it last week and was really surprised at the amount of humour because I'm such a miserable bastard. <laughs> I was completely excluded from any of the job. Uh, I, I was, my character was completely grounded in vengeance. He was like a maniac for revenge. The idea, I think, with Alan and Kevin was to, to suggest that the, um, the, uh, the Dark Elves were as ancient a race as the Asgardians and had a history, which is why we gave them a language and had a culture, but most of all they had a grudge which they had slept on for millions of years. And what's interesting about the film is it does have a variety of tones and myself and Ada Warley, who unfortunately is not here, played um, Algrim and Curse. Our job was to bring the threat and the menace and the je jeopardy, so we, we ground it in bitterness. <laughs> Costume on, and you were so bitter and angry by the time it was over. That <laughs> My makeup call was about three o'clock. I was in the chair about four o'clock, ten o'clock. I hit the set, so I was not a happy elf. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that? Um, yeah, the the humor. I think also the the fact that the characters are going through, even though they're traveling between realms, are going through things that we can all relate to. You know for myself playing a woman who the guy didn't call back and disappeared and there's a long distance thing going on. <laughs> when it works out, she meets the parents. You know, those are all things that obviously most women can relate to most. And of course, I'm, I'm the mortal among the, the gods and villains near me. Um, so, so I guess that's naturally more grounded, but a lot of the issues I had of dealing with were, were human and even the brothers. I feel like that's so, Relatable as, as human as humans. Yeah. I, I remember uh, Hopkins uh, said something to me. We, we were first day on set on four one, and we walked in, and our outfits, and he has the eye patch, and the whole thing, and, and the sets. And he looked at me and said, oh, "There's no acting required here." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I always remember that and think, like, "Yeah, don't compete with it. You know, like keep it simple." And and it already sells a lot of the work for you. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I can't add much to what everyone else has already said. I, I suppose um, the thing that, that uh, I always think is, is grounding about these films is, that is, is the family relationships for me. Um, we're traveling through space and time, we're dealing with gods and monsters, um, and uh, 
the, the heart of the film, from my perspective, is, is a family, a father, two sons, two brothers, a mother, and the fractious, intimate um, interaction that they have. Oh my dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think Darcy is maybe the most grounded person in the story. Uh, even if she's kind of spacey in her brain, she's not in space. So um, and I mean, I think Darcy's love for Jane and my love for Nat is pretty, you know, easy way for me to stay grounded in the whole thing. Um, I love you. <laughs> yeah, and I get to be the, the outsider to all the craziness and comment on it, I think. I mean, uh, both Marvel and DC obviously have had successes at the cinema, but Marvel seems to have a very, very good strategy uh, for a universe, not just on the big screen, but obviously TV as well. How coordinated is that, and how far ahead are you looking? I know there's talk about more TV series after S.H.I.E.L.D., more phases in the cinema. How is it one effectively sort of one package you're looking at and clockwork as it were? Uh, for the most part it is. We're a very tight knit group at the studio, so all the movies are, are very, very coordinated. And we have them announced through the end of twenty fifteen, but are planning um, as far out as, as uh, twenty seventeen. Uh, and, and sometime next year we'll announce what those what those films are for sixteen and seventeen. The TV division is up and running now, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. obviously was their first series. I, I know they'd love to bring more uh, things to the, uh, to the TV screen. I'm not sure exactly what or when that will be. Um, and in terms of, uh, of S.H.I.E.L.D., yes, they sort of cue off of what's happening in the movies and occasionally check in with us and go, would it be okay if we play with this little aspect? Um, uh, so it is quite coordinated, but it's, again, such a small group, it doesn't feel um, over, like an overwhelming task. It's just a, a heck of a lot of fun. And actually, um, I believe your mum keeps a scrapbook of photos that she allows out on set for such eventualities and all these shots in the flat scene are you through the ages. Um, do you wish that scrapbook would go away or <laughs> someone who can look at themselves on DVD age 10, um, are you sort of not worried about your old image? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess the funny thing is that it is, I think, the same set of photos that she always lends out for every movie I've done for the past 20 years. So <laughs> there's a lot of characters that shouldn't have the same experiences and family photos, but do. Um, hopefully, they're you know more background and people aren't really focusing on them. But yeah, all sorts of different people have been like photoshopped into them. You know? There's some interesting ones of like me and Toby McGuire from when I'm young, and <laughs> but not real, of course. <laughs> but, um, you know, various. I've worked with. Well, you know, we, people say conflict is, is drama, and Malekith is the antagonist here, but we keep talking still about the brothers and the romantic dynamic. What's really the dynamic with Malekith, and what does what it mean? What, what, what's, what's the point of that storyline here, do you all think? It's Chris, I like Chris. You, Chris. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what is the point of my story? <laughs> That's what I said to my agent. That's what I said to Kevin. The point of my storyline is for me to get paid. The point of my storyline, um, I'm repeating myself slightly, it's vengeance. He is a maniac for vengeance. There were some scenes which, for understandable reasons, uh, didn't make the final cut, which explained a bit of a backstory between me, my ancestors, and Ball, who is Odin's uh, father. Um, but basically the Dark Elves, before the Big Bang, before the Big Bang, centuries and centuries ago, were humiliated in defeat and ground into the dirt by Odin. And uh, Malachith has slept on that. And uh, the theme of that, the theme of that element is, is, is vengeance, really, as we know. Uh, as somebody once, somebody said, you know, let he who seeks vengeance be careful to dig two graves because it's a pointless exercise. Um, but that's it. My job was to bring a dark element, the, the dark world. The, the dark elves are seeking to turn the light into darkness. It's, it's really that simple. And that classic, if you like. And, and we needed that in a movie where our, our villain from, from Avengers, we wanted to play in a slightly more ambiguous way. 
in order to do that, we needed somebody who could drive the entire storyline and give Thor a reason to uh, uh, to have something to fight against. I'll jump in on this one. Um, I mean, Malekith is a purist. He's a fundamentalist. He's a zealot. Uh, one of the major themes in the movie for me is something that you know, most of our characters have to confront in one way or another. Uh, and it was a question. It was a, it was a theme that was expressed very clearly by Malekith in the scene that you will find on your Blu-ray, um, uh, where he's confronting Odin and he, he says, um, you have to ask yourself, as I once did, what are you willing to sacrifice for what you believe? And it's, every character goes to a turning point like that in the movie, and, and Malekith is the kind of guy who would sacrifice anything for principle, yeah. and we've seen him do it, and Thor learns a difficult version of that and decides to go a different way. Malekith is the main enemy in this, so Loki, he's, although he's seen as the enemy, he's not the main antagonist. Deep down, do you think Loki is really evil, or is it just a jealous facade on the outside? Um, uh, it's uh, it's 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 a question that I've asked myself three times. Um, and, um, it's um, you know I I think yeah every villain is a hero in his own mind, um, and people make choices. And, uh, and they always justify those choices, no matter how misguided their motivation. And, um, and the great privilege and thrill for me to play this character across three films is, is, is that he didn't start out that way. And, um, and the uh, storyline, the narrative that was afforded to me in the very first film, this idea of, of, of a young prince who was brought up believing in his, um, his right to a throne, his, his inheritance of um, his, his Asgardian inheritance, that this whole story was a lie, that he was adopted and, and left to die on a frozen rock, and that that essentially is, is what breaks his heart, and, and all of his, his villainy, all of his, um, his bad guy credentials come from something deeply vulnerable. And um, that's a gift, because it means across across Thor, across Avengers, across the dark world, that I can play a dynamic with Chris and with Anthony Hopkins and Ray Rousseau, which is, to what extent is he redeemable? Can he be pulled back towards the light? Um, and um, it's a very, very fun um, fault line to dance on. <laughs> yeah, what Tom said. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly it. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know so much? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a good note on which to end. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Thanks for your questions. And thanks so much to all the Kevin Feige, Christopher Eggleston, Matthew Horton, Chris Hedger, Tom Hicks, and Catherine.